okay so we are now starting our uh, options uh, KB so now let's just before I start our options let's okay guys they're still talking here I'm, I'm still hearing voices okay before we start on uh, uh, so this is we are going to start our uh, conceptual framework for equity option trading again this has been this module has been front-ended this should actually have been at the last uh, in, in the last part of the course this has been front-ended because you have to do your project so I have to give you some I mean even with this you'll feel that you're not adequately equipped knowledge wise to do your option trading but that's just something we can't help because of the scheduling of the course uh, we, but even then you'll get a feel for option trading and what is involved the complexity of the of the business uh, so what we are doing is we are actually front-ending this in what sense this is what I mean by front-ending okay if we look at this framework we make it much smaller okay I think you can see options so we can't see it fully but you can see that's the last column okay so in this framework what we would have ideally done is what we have uh, what we would have ideally done is we would when we were starting the study of derivative products we would have started with futures and forwards you've already done a little bit about futures you know how futures settle you know the daily mark to market mechanism of futures contracts that we studied okay so that is an essential feature of all exchange traded markets that is why you notice that futures are, are written as exchange traded markets okay so there is no uh, you will never find futures as an OTC product it's always exchange traded all right so we would have ideally started with futures and forwards which are very very similar uh, products if there's some cash flow differences and then we would have gone on to swaps and then finally we would have covered options ideally okay because options are the most complex uh, instrument type but we don't have the luxury of that because we are doing this project so we are front-ending the option uh, module all right now just a little bit briefly on options so this entire thing is there in your folder in the equity option trading uh, this one in this folder you'll find this entire KB so you don't have to write anything so once again remember let me reiterate uh, is that all we can have 100 we can actually maybe do even better than this Yeah, you guys can can you guys read input parameters at the, on the last bench yes sir. you can read input parameters used to price an option you can read this stuff okay so this is okay so that means we can have maybe even bigger make it 125 okay I know why this is happening because I reduced the zoom on uh, on the browser overall that's why we suddenly have this change okay right so we have this this is your note and this is where your readings are okay so start doing the readings in this sequence okay uh, start doing the readings from your textbook Halbasu and uh, these are your links that I'll put the links links randomly into this and this is our uh, asset classes market so here in the introduction okay so options uh, options are what a derivative instrument or a underlying instrument derivatives okay so there is one exception to that and that is uh, you should be aware of that uh, we are not going to cover it it's not a very um, so let's write it this way add options are always derivative products or derivative instruments okay uh, exception is something called a compound option okay you will find this in that book which I've written you'll find if you want to learn about compound options you will see a discussion of compound options compound options is where you have options you have call options and call options call options and put options okay so these are options and options these are not standard products so they don't trade actively but the, the product does exist I mean it existed as far back as 1993 so um, and, and they still exist so therefore you should be aware of this exception also so options in general are always derivative instrument except for compound options where one of the uh, where the underlying instrument is also underlying asset is also an option okay so you can have a call on a call call on a put okay put on a call put on a put all these kinds of combinations so you can read up on compound options I just put the mnemonic here so you can read up in that booklet uh, uh, risk management solutions okay so options are always derivative instruments now here we have to put in one more exception there are some limitations in this framework because 
I'm not drawing freehand, I'm constrained by the Excel formatting and all that. So now there are certain types of various, you can have options on. Um, so the first thing to understand about options is, options are derivative instruments, okay? So what is the characteristic of a derivative instrument? I don't know if, if we've discussed this before. What is it? Let's first understand the very basic concept of an option, which is, uh, what is a derivative instrument? We'll just use the word derivative product because it's shorter. Okay. So what is a derivative instrument? How will we define that? Guys, Mike, pass the mic. Who's going to answer that? Is the question clear? How should we? Because everything that you study, you should be clear about what the definition is, right? The definition makes a very big difference to your conceptual clarity. You should be able to understand that. You should be able to have the definition clearly in your head. What is this? Okay. Uh, what is a derivative product? Okay, so how should we define a derivative product? Anybody? Yes? I hear some, somebody whispering. Anybody? Who? Who is Sakshan? Okay, who want, anybody wants to answer derivative product? Okay, yes, use the mic. Derivative products uh, derive their value from the underlying aspects. Okay, okay, good. So, um, value, so I'm just writing, we're not writing a very uh, proper full uh, English sentence, but value is derived from an <coughs> underlying asset. Okay, that's why you say that um, the, that's why you use the word derivative. Okay. So the value is derived from an underlying asset. Strictly speaking, to make this, uh, so you can see here that uh, you you can see here what the underlying markets are and the derivative markets are. Cash and spot are the underlying in this framework. But because of the limitations, now we'll come to that. But first, let's just get the derivative definition clear. So the derivative instrument is one whose value is derived from an underlying asset. Is normally that's the definition you'll see in most of the books. But actually, this definition needs to be made a little bit more watertight. Because um, this is strictly speaking not correct. What it what should uh, what it, what we should actually say is the value is derived inter alia Now you know this expression inter alia, you know what it means? Who knows? Who remembers? Among other things. Very good. Okay. So, among other things, you would have covered this while doing uh, lab. But it's a very useful uh, expression. Okay. Whenever you talk, try to make use of inter alia wherever you can. Because it will give you flexibility. Okay. So, that later on you can add other stuff. Okay. So, why do I write it like this? Instead of just saying the value is derived from an underlying asset. Because when you look at the formula for pricing derivative products, you will find that uh, it's not that the underlying value of the underlying asset alone makes up the value of the contributes to the value of the derivative product. There are other variables also that contribute like interest rates, volatilities, etc. Okay, so that's why I use the word inter alia. Okay, and what we say is that it derives principally from uh, the value is derived inter alia principally. Let's make it a little bit better from the value of an underlying asset. Is this clear? So now we have a slightly more uh, legalistic definition. Okay, it is always important to have legalistic definitions because it clears your mind. You know exactly what why you are writing this kind of thing because it, it gives you a better picture of the reality. Okay, so the value of a derivative instrument is derived inter alia principally from the value of an underlying asset. Okay, so and, and the reason I put inter alia is because there are other factors like interest rates, uh, volatilities, etc., which go into the uh, dividends. So all of these are actually factors also in a, and if you change any of these other factors also, the not the non-principal factors, okay? Uh, even if you change the values of those, the value of the derivative product will change. So it is strictly speaking from a legalistic point of view, not correct to say just that the derivative is one whose value is derived from an underlying asset, because that would give the impression that only the underlying asset com contributes to the value. Is this clear? Again, we are speaking in long English sentences, but this is what you have to get used to. Comprehension has to be improved because otherwise you're not actually speaking correctly. This is clear. Satyam is already falling asleep. Okay, good. 
So why don't you guys come to the front? We let's stack the front benches. Okay. Who's going to come to the front bench? Uh, let's bring. Uh, we can bring some of these people here. Let's bring uh, Ishan and Bola come to the front. And s no, you're happy, but I'm not happy. You come. Bola can come and sit next to Chadda. You'll you'll be happier. It's his birthday, so you can wish him. And he'll be happy, and you'll also be happy. So Ishan can come and sit next to uh, Bell, and then uh, you guys, Tushar, uh, Tushar can come here. Tushar and Satyam come. Somebody sit next to Akanksha, and then let's bring who else? Let's bring uh, Nimish and all into uh, Shivani's row. So let's stack the front benches, and Keshav can also come somewhere. Keshav is can uh, Shushant can move in and Keshav can come here. You guys come here. Some, somebody sit next to Akanksha. This chair is a problem. Okay. So let's have stacking of the front benches. Where, where you, what happened to next to Akanksha? Seat is broken. Okay. All right. Okay. Fine. Uh, so uh, let, okay. So what? So what were we saying? So I just want to make sure that people are properly, uh, you know, <laughs> properly awake because the moment I go into a long sentence, uh, everybody seems to be dozing off. So it is important to write der derivative like this, okay? So the, um, um, or let's call it the instruments which um, form the underlying asset for options can be is my question clear now we are asking this question of since we are saying that options are derivative products and this expression underlying markets and derivative markets these expressions are used uh, uh, in tandem okay so we talk about underlying markets versus derivative markets sometimes we also say as you do a mouse over here is sometimes we also use this expression cash markets okay so uh, when we are talking about derivative markets we are talking about cash markets so this is why i say that finance is much more like law than like physics because all the terms uh, you'll see the same term being used in a different kind of context it has a slightly different meaning okay so when we use the word cash markets in conjunction with derivative markets it's not the same as the cash instrument are you following so why you have to be very sensitive to the context uh, to understand terms that are used in finance these are all mainstream terms that are used in industry okay so people will talk about cash markets versus derivative markets but when they are using that expression cash markets in that context that cash market could be referring to the spot market also okay because here cash markets is not only just cash instrument okay as a settlement date and transaction date is the same okay it's not this so you have to be aware of the context all the time okay so so my question is so we know that these are underlying markets and these are derivative markets so this actually labeling is not 100 percent correct because of the formatting restrictions of excel now we will remedy that deficiency what we are going to do is we are going to clarify so we know one thing we know that options are derivative products okay we know that options are derivative products and so every derivative product must have an underlying asset okay so one of the questions that is uh, that one should be clear about is uh, which instruments can form the underlying asset for an option is my question clear yes, sir. since we are saying an option is a derivative instrument uh, what types of instruments can form the underlying asset for uh, uh, a uh, option contract okay yes stocks. yeah common stocks so what we are talking about is instruments now okay so common stocks yes so what type of common stocks when you're talking typically about common stocks globally uh, where would it go in terms of instrument would it be in cash futures spots forwards yeah, where? Sports, sports. yeah it is actually spot okay mm -hmm. most equities globally will trade spot equities when you're talking about common stocks most uh, world markets will trade on a spot basis now that spot may be t plus two it may be t plus three and here in india now we are trying to move to t plus one okay so there might be a variation between t plus one to t plus three but it's around centered around t plus two so that's why we say spot is t plus two okay so typically so what we are saying one of the things that he's saying is one of the types of instruments will be spot okay 
Is this clear what we are listing out here? Yes, sir. What are the types of instruments that can form the underlying assets for an option contract? Okay, so first is pot. Okay, anything else can we add? I just gave you some information about a exotic <coughs> product based on which you should be able to give me one answer at least here. Options, options right? Who said that? Okay, okay, good. So options in the case of compound option. Okay, remember that option itself can be a uh, uh, underlying instrument for an option contract. This is quite rare, but it this is in the case of a compound option. So we can write this compound options as a uh, rare example, but it is possible. Okay, we should be aware of it. Now, so what else? Can we have anything else? I have also mentioned, uh, I've shown you certain uh, data feeds on the TWS. I have looked at crude oil options. I've experimented with crude oil, crude oil options in the class. So what were the, what were the uh, uh, underlying instruments for those options? Commodities. Commodities are not an instrument. Commodities are an asset class. What kind of instrument was a <coughs> yes futures right so you remember that this is also a very important type of uh, option uh, a very important type of uh, thing is futures okay so futures can also be a very important uh, underlying ins instrument for options okay so many of these uh, uh, options uh, crude oil options for instance will principally trade as uh, futures of these instruments are called futures options so let's put in the term here as well so whenever you hear futures options in fact when you're setting up your data feed in TWS you might actually get this option as well okay when you're setting up an option uh, you might get a feed option of they may ask you do you want futures options okay and that is typically written as FUT OPT okay that's called a futures options which is futures option means the option uh, is an option on a futures contract okay so that's an option to buy or sell a future a futures contract okay unlike the common example of equity options which you will be trading those are uh, on spot those are options on spot okay but you should be aware that you can also have futures options in fact most of the commodity options are futures options most of the exchange traded if you notice here that under currencies under currencies, uh, well, not just I couldn't make a separate classification for that. You notice that under op, uh, on top of options, I've given both exchange traded and OTC because options trade in both OTC and exchange traded markets. Okay, so for instance, the main foreign exchange options market is actually an OTC market. Okay, but uh, the op, there are also for a few uh, 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 there are also options on uh, currency futures. Okay, so those are futures options. So ideally what I would do is I don't have the formatting skills for that. I don't even know if it's possible. Ideally, I would shade half of this box green and half of it blue because you can have options on currencies. You can have them trading either as futures options. Okay. In which case they are exchange traded and you can also have them trading as OTC FX options in which case they are OTC market uh, instruments. Okay. So the bulk of FX option trading is OTC. But there's also a significant volume uh, on the CME uh, and maybe some other exchanges also have set up now. But CME was the main venue uh, for uh, futures options on currencies. Okay, so pretty much every instrument, uh, pretty much every uh, uh, market on which there is a futures contract, you will also have a futures option. Okay, pretty much not maybe not for all of them, but uh, most of them will have that. So this is something else to be aware of. Okay, you can also have you can also have forwards. Let's call this futures options. <coughs> you can also have options on forwards. Okay. So your OTC FX options are actually options on forwards. Okay. So um, that's, that's another type of underlying instrument that you have. So you can have forwards and you can also have, um, do you see something else here? Another type of instruments, another type of instrument under interest rates. You can't see the left hand side here under debt. Okay. Okay. Under debt, under options, I've listed various types of options. All these products you can read up in that book, 
risk management survey if you want. This is not part of your syllabus. You won't have time to cover all these in the class. But if you want to read up on all this, all this is covered in that interest rate under the interest rate risk management chapter. Okay, if you want to read up on all these products, interest rate IRGs are interest rate guarantees, caps, flows, okay, collars, corridors, all kinds of stuff. Okay, you can read out. These are all interest rate options. Those are interest rate collars, corridors. There's also something called a swaption. Okay, that is also listed under debt at the intersection of debt and options. Okay, a swaption is actually an option on a swap. Okay, so what we should do now is we should take this also. So what we are saying is out of the types of instruments, pretty much every type of instrument can form an underlying instrument for an option contract. Is this clear? Even swaps. So you're not clear about this last part. So even a swap, you have not really seen, you've already seen some examples. Remember when we discussed uh, those uh, swap driven issuance transactions, what were they doing? We discussed five types of capital market swaps, single currency interest rate, cross uh, single currency fixed floating interest rate swaps, single currency basis swaps, both legs floating one currency. If you remember all this, now let's, you guys have already forgotten because you guys are not revising. This will be under TED. Didn't we just cover the whole category of capital market swap? It's a very important type of instruments. Very important type of instruments. So we have already covered in this framework. Swaps, we have already covered most of uh, one part of it. We did not have a chance to cover FX swaps. Okay. But we have already covered uh, the, um, we have already covered IRS and currency swaps. Okay. What the market calls IRS and currency swaps, which we have classified in this manner, which is, um, yeah, this manner. We classified in this manner. So these are all what the market will refer to as swaps. And the FX swaps, the market will refer to as FX swaps. Okay, that's why you notice how important it is to be uh, very, very particular about the terminology. Because the market will use some particular terminology. And sometimes you have problems because like what I've taught you uh, in this particular, uh, what is happening with this, this constant so sound of somebody talking. Okay, now um, uh, you have to be very, very particular about the use of terms in the market. You have to be aware of what term the market is using for what instrument. And sometimes, and like in the case of, uh, you know, these capital market swaps, where I've also given you uh, what I think is a better theoretical taxonomy. So you have to then understand the taxonomy at two levels. One is what is theoretically correct and what is one is what the market is using. Okay, that is required. So therefore, it's very complicated. So make sure you have to you guys have to revise all this stuff because you're hearing all these instruments. You're hearing all these names for the first time. If you don't revise, you will not be. And once you revise it and understand the concept, you'll never forget it in your life. Okay, but you need to make that put in that effort. So now are you clearer what I mean? One type of swap is a capital market swap, which we, which the market categorizes into interest rate swaps and currency swaps. Okay, IRS and currency swaps. And so these we have seen. Now these are also instruments. Okay, which you can transact in. Okay, you saw that company XYZ Corp was doing a cross currency IRS with Standard Chartered. Okay, so that's an instrument. Okay, now that type of instrument can also form an underlying instrument for a option contract, and that would be called a swaption. Okay, those are called swaptions. There also you can read up in that book itself, you'll find the discussion of swaptions, payer swaptions, receiver swaptions, okay, all kinds of uh, swaptions. So, for pretty much all type of instrument, uh, all type of instruments is, uh, every type of instrument is, no, this is still forwards, so we should call it. swaptions okay all right so when you have an option on a swap that's called a swaption okay here the swap is referring to the capital market type of swap okay interest rate swaps and currency swaps and it is not referring to foreign exchange swaps so you see how complex market terminology is and how careful you have to be because normally what do we say normally when we are looking at a when we initially just started broadly discussing uh, the the asset classes this particular framework we often refer to currency markets as foreign exchange markets, don't we? We refer to currency markets as foreign exchange markets. We say FX markets. Okay. So in general, so you have to be very, very careful. That's why I'm saying that. Uh, that's why I always say finance is much more like law. 
that you'll be very careful about what context is uh, what is the context when you're using terms so normally when you're referring to currency markets you can talk about you can say fx markets foreign exchange markets okay but when you're talking about swaps you have to be very careful because uh, an fx swap or a foreign exchange swap which is a term that the market will use for a different and now that is different from what you studied here these are what I have called capital market swaps okay that's not a market terminology but I needed to create a difference between uh, FX swaps and swaps okay because that uh, that taxonomy is not proper if you you can't call one category you can't call these things swaps you have to call them capital market swaps so that FX swaps is different because if you call them swaps uh, then FX swaps will have to have the properties of these swaps okay so you understand the taxonomy problem right if I call if I say all students okay all students must be carrying a ruler if you're not carrying a ruler you're not a student okay then if I make a subcategory of BCA student then I can say the BCA student is carrying a ruler obviously he has to carry a ruler because he's a student and it top on top of that he carries a calculator now I can define a BCA student like that okay then I can say MBA uh, uh, a PGDM student is uh, also carrying a, uh, a copy of economic times so therefore PGDM student must also be carrying a ruler because he's a student you understand what I'm saying you understand how taxonomy has to be very very particular so the moment you define uh, uh, a PGDM student as a species of student and you have said that what is the characteristic of a student is a person who's carrying a ruler so that means PGDM student if you say that fellow has to carry a ruler and on top of that you have given him another property that he carries a copy of economic times are you following so that's why we can't have a taxonomy which the market uses the market says these things actually are swaps and there's another type of instrument which you have not yet studied which is a foreign exchange swap that's not proper because the foreign exchange swap has very little similarity to this instrument are you following so it's like saying that student is somebody who also carries who always carries a ruler but pgdm students don't carry any rulers are you following the problem it's a little complicated but it's important for you to understand these terms the uh, this kind of logic that's why we had a brief discussion on logic this is where you get conceptual clarity this is part of how you get are you following the problem if I say that a student is somebody who has to always be carrying a ruler then I define a PGDM student as somebody who's carrying only economic ties but no ruler then how can he be a student if he's not carrying a ruler he can't be a student <coughs> So if you define a subcategory, so that will that must have all the characteristics of the general, uh, the higher level category. So if you are a PGDM student or a BCS student or an LLB student, you have to be carrying a ruler. On top of that, you can LLB student will carry a copy of the contract act. You can say that that's okay. But then you can't have a subcategory of student who will not be carrying a ruler. Are you following? Is this clear? Tushar is confused. How is it confusing? Now I, I can't accept confusion on the. I, I mean, I, I'll explain it 15 times if required, but everyone must be clear about this. That if we have, this is very important, otherwise, you will not have conceptual clarity of this kind of basic. This is like set theory. Okay, this is like set theory. So yes. now, so you have to, these kinds of categorize. That's why I keep on using this expression. You know, contract is a species of agreement. I keep on rehashing the same thing because I want to make sure people have understood. So let's see very clear. A student is somebody who has a, who has to be carrying a ruler. Okay. Now LLB student will carry a copy of con of the contract act. Okay, but he has to have it because he's a student, so he has to have a ruler. In addition to the ruler, he must have a copy of the contract act. PGDM student will have a copy of the Economic Times, and BCA student will have a calculator. Okay, but all these all these three categories, because they are all categories of student, they must carry a ruler also. Okay, so now what happened? This is all I'm saying. Now what I'm saying is that the market terminology, whereby the market has this kind of uh, see the market calls these things swaps okay let me put it here which I'm saying is not correct okay the market calls these things swaps and then the market derives defines another category which is FX swaps which is very different from these instruments okay so therefore you can't call these you can't call these FX swaps because if you the moment you call these FX swaps this must have all the characteristics of swaps 
Okay, are you following? Yes. Okay, see, so make sure that everybody has understood this. Namita, have you followed this logic? No. What are you doing? You are busy exchanging something with Sandhya. Has Sandhya understood this? You understood? Okay, good. So, please, so that's why I'm saying, so you have to understand my logic also. You should be able to explain it to others. Because in the market, the terminology is when they are referring to these types of instruments here, they will call them swaps. And when they are referring to another type of instrument which you have not seen, okay, that is called an FX swap, okay. You have actually seen the structure of this, that is, it's just nothing like a, but a intra-market spread, okay. It's an intra-market spread, it's just like a repo. It's exactly the same structure as a repo, but we have not covered the instrument correct, uh, prop, a, a individually. But the point is, it's very different in structure from this. So therefore, you can't start defining now a PGDM student as somebody with no ruler. <coughs> Then you can't call him a PGDM student. Are you following? <laughs> Everyone is clear about this? Yes. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, good. So this is what I'm saying. So that's why I'm saying you have to be very particular about the terminology. You learn the terminology where there are conceptual problems in the way the market applies terminology. And there are many of them because the market <laughs> does not think like an academic and what should be the proper categorization logically. They don't, they don't have time for all this because there are opportunities coming. They need to come out with new products and seize the opportunity. So the market comes out with terminology without thinking about it too much. That's why you have uh, stupid terminology like CDS. Credit default swap has nothing to do with a swap. It's actually uh, like a barrier option. Okay. So uh, therefore, uh, so you have, but still you can't t tell the market what to do. Okay, whatever the market terminology is, you have to learn that terminology. But you should also be clear in your head as to why this is not conceptually correct. Okay, so that as an MBA student, you must have that clarity. Okay. All right. So what were we saying? Swaptions. Okay. So when the market talks about swaptions, it is referring to what I have called capital market swaps as the underlying instrument. Okay. Or the market calls. Uh, so the market will just say swaptions are options on swaps. Okay, so what you have learned now is in the introduction to options is the proper definition of a derivative instrument. Okay, and what are the types of underlying? Um, okay, it could be underlying asset for options uh, can be all these can be uh, accepted. All right. Okay, so. Right now we are ready to move on to the next module in this. Okay, so far everyone is clear. Okay, now we have to look at. Now we should do this exercise as, as an exercise. Okay, without showing you the answers. Let's have some really big font size here. Okay, now. Uh, tell me when you are specifying an option, okay? When you are like when you go, if you go to a car dealer uh, and just say, I want to buy a car, does he have clarity now? No, sir. Because you need to tell him what four wheel drive, sedan, or what you want to buy, what Hyundai or whatever, whatever Toyota, or whatever you want to buy, okay? What should be the engine power and the what horsepower and this and that, okay? What should be the features? So you don't know, uh, you need to specify a lot of things in order for the car dealer to be clear as to what you want okay so similarly when you're going to an option dealer and asking for a price for an option okay what are the things that you have to specify okay you don't need to take notes this is all written in your notes but um, i will uh, maybe i should just move the notes so that nobody uh, okay we'll just see it's, it doesn't matter um, Okay, tell me, is my question clear? Yes. If you want to buy an option, okay, if you just say to the dealer, I want to buy an option, okay, give me a price. I want to buy an option, okay, or I want a price for an option, okay, uh, give me both bid and offer, okay. Uh, is that, that's obviously not sufficient for him because he needs to have more clarity about what actually do you want, okay. <laughs> so, yes. One by one, one by one. Yes, Tushar, give him the mic. Sir, date firstly, the date of uh, which month? Uh, uh, date of what? 
expiry date. Who said expiry? <laughs> okay. So expiration date is one factor. Okay. So you need to now somebody has opened this. Ishan has opened the uh, spreadsheet. Okay. Fine. No problem. You can open the spreadsheet. But it's much bigger over here than on, on your phone. Okay. So one is the expiry date. All right. One is the expiry date. That's clear. Okay. So now you have some clarity when you set up your options. When you set up the option trader in TWS, you can see that there are various expiries for which options are trading. The same option is trading for various expiries. So that's one thing that you have to clarify to the dealer that I want an option for three month expiry. Okay. That's one. Anything else? Premium. One minute. No, premium is something that he's going to quote you. The premium is just the price of the option. Okay. So premium as you can remember it from insurance premium as well. Insurance contracts are also option contracts. You've studied insurance. Yes, yes, you did a course on insurance. Yes, okay. Sir. So insurance is also like an option uh, contract. Okay. I pay a premium to uh, take fire insurance on my on my house uh, on my home, and then if my home burns down, then I will exercise that option and ask him for comp ask the insurance company for compensation. So the money I pay for the price of the option as a price of the option is the premium. Okay. So even in the in, uh, the financial markets. Uh, we, we use the same terminology option price is the premium. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, premium is something that will be uh, that will be provided by the dealer. Here we are talking about what are the things that you need to clarify to the dealer. Asset class. asset class well is it asset class really is that sufficient. You have to judge actually to specify the market instrument combination. Okay, you have to press specify the uh, market instrument combination, which is the underlying asset for that particular thing. Asset class is because asset class is very broad. If I, if you just say I want a foreign exchange option, there are so many foreign exchange markets, right? So that's not sufficient. Asset class is not. So you have to really specify what is called the market instrument combination. Okay. Maybe this should be small. You understand what I mean by market instrument combination? Okay, because every market is always trading in some kind of instrument or the other. So if you want, for instance, uh, if you want a, um, a currency, if you want an option on a futures, uh, a currency futures contract, okay, let's say you have the Australian dollar futures contract and you want an option on the Australian dollar futures contract. Now that is different from wanting an option on uh, an OTC FX option on Australian dollars, which is actually an option on a forward. Okay, so uh, because these are all uh, European style op options. So these are two different things, although everything is the same. Asset class obviously is the same, the market is the same, it's Australian dollars. Okay, but the instrument is not the same. <coughs> are you following now? Yes. The market is we say Aussie dollar against US dollar is the market. Okay, but that market can trade in various uh, in the form of various instruments. It can trade as a spot market same thing Aussie dollars US dollars it can trade as a futures contract it can trade as a forward contract okay so therefore the market remains the same but the instrument is changing so that's why I say that you have to specify and then and there and obviously if a dealer is giving you an option price where the underlying is an Australian dollar FX futures contract that's a different option price from uh, if he's giving you an option on a forward contract Okay, so therefore you have to specify what is called the market instrument combination. Okay, because every market is always trading in some instrument or the other in the form of some instrument or the other. But the dealer, because there are so many possible instruments, okay, the dealer offhand will not know what instrument you are thinking of. This is clear. All right. So that's why you have to specify the market instrument combination. Asset class is not sufficient. That's too broad. Okay, currencies, Australian dollars are part of an asset class. But everything else is oh, so many other currency combinations are in that. Okay, is this clear, everyone? Okay, so you have to clarify the market instrument combination. Okay, what else? Call or put. Call or put. Very good. Whether you want a price on a call or a put. Okay. Anything else? You've done options, haven't you? In FM1, FM2? No. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You've done some, right? So I think you've done some basic stuff. Did you do intrinsic value, time value? Yes. You did all this? <coughs> time value, intrinsic value has been done? Yes. Now you've forgotten. 
So, okay, call, put anything else? Why is what else? Anything else? Yes? No, no, those are strategies. Butterfly spreads and all those are option strategies. We haven't even reached there yet. We are now talking about very basic stuff. Like you want to, okay, you came into the showroom and you want to buy a TV. Now I'm a, as a salesman, I'm confused. Well, you want LCD, LED? Which brand do you want? What should be the screen size? How many ports should be there in the TV? All these things you have to clarify. Otherwise, how will I give you the price? Okay. So similarly, you have to clarify many things. What else? Anything else, guys? Can we quickly speed it up? Have you heard of something called strike price? Yes, or exercise price? Yes, sir. What is that? At which? The trade, yeah. And when you exercise the option that you buy the underlying, buy or sell the underlying op op asset at the uh, price. exercise price or the strike price. Okay. So therefore, you have to mention exercise stroke strike price. No market order here. We are just asking for market order as an order. That's in a, in a in a kind of a quote driven market. Here you're asking a dealer for a price. Okay, you're not placing an order. Okay, <laughs> you are talking about. Uh, we are just trying to understand the various aspects that need to be clarified in order for the dealer to be able to give you a price. Okay, so exercise price and strike price has to be covered. Okay, anything else? Can you think of margin? That yeah, margin and all is uh, that depends on where you are in OTC or exchange trading. Okay, did you guys when you did FM1, FM2, did you do different styles of exercise? American style, European style? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you've done it. Some people remember. Graduation. Not in FM1, FM2. Not in FM1, FM2. Exercise style is also important. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what exercise style okay so now let's go to your notes and see so these are the five items that you'll have to specify to your dealer okay and then there are some other points also that need to be uh, uh, fed into the option uh, valuation model okay yes European and European American and there's a third type which is what lies between Europe and America no no there's something in the ocean there's uh, anything that that any particular part any particular country are reminded of if I use the word triangle Bermuda okay so there is something called a Bermudan option also okay so we have to see that so we'll see now this is just for your uh, testing okay so let's look at this now okay so you have call put these are the things that we looked at okay we have to really say uh, here we have to say market instrument combination so let's just copy it from there underlying asset is a term that we are using for um, all right for relative to the derivative product what is the underlying asset okay but here uh, to be very specific what you have to be looking for is the what you have to specify the market instrument combination okay that I want an option on uh, Aussie US FX forward okay six month FX forward okay that's that's how the uh, specification has to be described okay uh, okay so these are the things that you have to now exercise style you guys are learning some of you okay let's assume you didn't do it in FM1 FM2 so read the three styles while I rest my voice please read the three styles And then read the other three also, six, seven, and eight. Yes. <laughs> Who was sleeping? So since Bermuda is halfway between Europe and, and the US, so they have created a Bermudan style which is kind of a mix of both. Is everyone clear about exercise style now? Yes. 
you understand what is meant by exercise style yes okay so now so these are the things you have to clarify as a user okay you have to define all these uh, inputs okay then uh, otherwise the dealer is not clear and then what the dealer will also do is the dealer will enter these three um, just remove the word asset now okay let's just keep asset here asset always means market instrument combination I want to just make it all fit in one line okay so the volatility is one important input these three inputs have to be put in by the dealer okay because you will not know this the dealer will know, know this information so he will put in the volatility of the interest uh, underlying asset okay interest rate obviously is these are related to uh, all of these are related to um, so expiration is a key factor okay uh, over life of option means obviously related to expiration so if you're talking about a three month option okay what is happening here now again I have to deduct marks from Satyam's team and uh, Shivani's team there's some activity going on now we have to open this uh, CP sheet so so uh, understand that so when we talk about volatility what is the volatility of this particular asset uh, that is obviously everything is with respect to the uh, tenor of the option okay whatever the expiration date obviously the discussion of volatility is happening with respect to that period okay because the volatility for a different period will be um, a different uh, figure so Satyam is in GABA's team. Where is Satyam? Yeah, GABA's team. And Achil's team is the top scorer, I think, this time. Very active. Her controls are not working. Okay. <laughs> okay let's go back to this so we so these three six seven and eight six seven and eight have to be entered by the dealer okay uh, and obviously it is obvious but I'm just mentioning it just to be clear so that you have a the reiteration of the importance of the expiration date so when we are talking about the uh, so in future I'm just going to uh, instead of using a big word like vol already I'm just going to say vol okay so vol means volatility I may use two words I may use H vol for historical volatility or I vol for implied volatility okay but I'm just going to use vol so uh, vol is uh, obviously for the uh, tenor of the option similarly interest rate is also for the tenor of the option okay if you're talking about a six month option we are only interested in the six month interest rate not in five year interest rates and things like that and expected dividends over the pair this is a stock market uh, this is a stock option terminology the more general term would be expected uh, I think we should write it the other way we should write the general category first expected uh, so I'm just going to uh, use the word yield okay so dividend is a type of yield do you agree yes, okay yield is any kind of return so dividend is a return on an asset okay where the asset is the stock so we are going to say expected yield on that is what we really mean okay expected yield on the underlying asset okay again obviously this is also pertaining to the period of the option only okay everything is pertaining expected yield on underlying asset as a general expression because dividends will only apply to stock so we can write this in the bracket as example dividends okay all right so this is what so these are the factors that go into the pricing of an option okay is this clear okay so these things all of these things as you see um, so here I've said here um, so everything is written over here I wall H fall now please be careful here many people uh, who are not properly trained 
often talking about age fall when you are expanding the uh, when you are expressing the full term people say historic volatility it's not historic it's historical you know what is the difference between historic and historical it's historical yes who will explain again no answers of the english language but you have to be very very careful because you are an mba you are expected to be skilled in the use of language okay what is the difference why do i why am i so particular about the, the difference between historic and historical yes so historical since it's not an english class let's not spend too much time on it but uh, you need to know be aware of the difference okay uh, especially for vol when we say age vol we mean historical not historic okay historical is anything that belongs to the past so when we stand today we can say that all dates in the past are historical dates okay historic dates are certain specific dates which have a special significance so we can say that uh, 26 january 1950 is a historic date for india because that is the date on which constitution constitution was adopted okay so historic date is a special date so a historic date is again what we use the what is the language we should use a historic date is a species of historical date okay that all historic dates are historical but all historical dates need not be historic will typically not be historic because historic date is something which is a special date okay is everyone clear yes. okay so because many times you will find people in the markets also even using historic vol it's not actually historic it's historical okay all right okay so uh, these are the input parameters if you want to get a sense of it you can look at this uh, option now i think we should uh, yeah i'm going to mention this uh, another thing that we are going to see is again the difference between the market lingo and the um, uh, and and what should be the correct theoretical uh, lingo okay let's look at this here uh, maybe yeah let's have a look at it first uh let's have a look at this if you go here and use click on this optionprice.com this is what you will get i don't know if this that link is also there i think or i'll put the link okay so here's an example but i think we have to make it much smaller all right but now you can't see the figures it doesn't matter you don't have to see the figures actually you do need to see the figures how are we going to make it work i can't even move this okay let's just try once but can you at least read the nimish can you read the writing underlying price theoretical price over here can you read that yes yes okay okay so you can see here that this is an option pricing model which the market will refer to as an option pricing model but we will refer to as a option i mean you should have your in your own mind you should understand that what the market calls uh, option pricing models actually those are valuation models okay so the difference between price and pricing and valuation model but the market will always use option pricing model okay so these are all option pricing models these are some of the examples if you look at this i'll just put this also in your notes so you can uh, tinker around uh, all right now you can see these are various models so black shows model you've heard of yes i was told to give you some guys uh, guys some idea about the models the basic models okay so maybe we should just list them as well so actually the proper term that is uh, it should be black shows merton okay uh, because robert merton also contributed to the model that we used for uh, uh, equity option pricing so it's actually black shows merton but many people just call it black shows uh, but um, anyway so let's we will list the models but uh, these are the various types of models these are called option pricing models by the industry but i'll explain to you why they should actually be called valuation models okay so let's look at it uh, here okay you can see this is it bigger here this is slightly bigger the font same thing more or less you can see all these inputs that go into the model you have to specify what kind of model but that actually the dealer will decide okay 
and uh, then you have all the stock price here obviously this is meant for equity options so this should be the underlying asset price okay that the dealer knows he just you just have to tell him what price you look what market instrument combination you're looking at he will know what the price is okay so you see all this stuff is put in and I think this one has a uh, uh, they are I think maybe they've got a paywall or something like that okay so they have some it's taking a long time to calculate if I put this here you can change the underlying price okay you can't see the value of the call option you guys can read at the back can you read Vibhu can you read 3.019 okay so if I change if we just look at some of the things if the underlying exercise price is 100 can you read the numbers last bench you can read the numbers okay so exercise price is 100 now if I change the underlying price from 100 to say 70 what will happen to the call option price so 100 to 70 it will increase the call option price will increase mm -hmm. sir no it will decrease underlying price mm -hmm. sir, it will actually this will take a long uh, this exercise maybe we should do at a later time but they just play it with it once okay so uh, it, will it will decrease why will it decrease so because sir exercise price is far away from the underlying price okay so what does that mean sir, yeah. the, sir, the price it will take time to reach the exercise price the <coughs> yeah so the chances of making our money on that option are much less now because the underlying price is uh, much lower than the exercise price yes. so if you have bought an option with the exercise price of 100 and the underlying price is at 70 then you have to wait for it to come all the way to 100 and even beyond that only then will you make some money yes. so therefore uh, rather than if it was already at 100 then there's a much better chance of making money so then you're willing to pay much more for it okay as you can see here if I change the underlying price to 70 and do calculate once again notice the call option is 3 point maybe I should just change the rounding to okay let's see right now we have 3 so we just calculate once again you see that it should go down okay the value of the call option essentially has gone to 0 okay there's such a big impact that it has actually gone to 0 all right so, uh, okay, so we can you can play around with this. This is also oh, I shut this. Stop seeing this ad. Okay, all right, so you can play around with this, but this is basically it. So, the point is that the dealer, these are the inputs. So, we are just starting out with basics. And these are the inputs that you need to enter into the option pricing model and uh, to get your prices okay all right now let's look at this particular thing a uh, little bit of theoretical discussion okay why it should be option valuation model rather than uh, in the industry uh, we say option pricing model okay uh, and so we say option pricing model okay of OPM OPM is also a term that in money management you should be aware of this also in in uh, TAM and AM OPM means let's reduce this other people's money This is a serious expression that is used okay other people's money because many money managers start out by managing only their own money so when you start out to uh, when you uh, start managing other people's money that's a different institutional framework is required so in TAM and AM in the world of asset management OPM has a different meaning okay here we'll just say OPM for option pricing model and what we are saying is that the correct terminology should have been option valuation model not option pricing model okay because why do I say that because that because pricing is basically what is called what we have already discovered as remember we we discussed talked about price discovery okay that means basically setting uh, setting and 
resetting market price okay uh, through not writing full sentences through interaction of through the interaction of supply and demand okay so all right so you remember when we discussed price discovery you remember the expression price discovery what is price discovery it's one of the most important functions of uh, markets this is why we have a market economy when you have a market economy the difference is that price discovery should all be clear about this is part, partly your economic theory as well okay why do you have money what is the difference between a capitalist economy and a socialist economy like when you had the soviet union okay what was happening in the soviet union the uh, allocation of resources was divided decided by the central planning committee okay like what we also had in india the planning commission and all that that was a soviet style planning okay so all the allocation of resources how much cement is going to go to construct school buildings versus how much is going to go to construct <coughs> factories whatever that is decided by the central planning committee whereas in a capitalist system you have price we have markets okay markets just have price discovery and as price discovery when when some, uh, when prices go up price discovery means prices are continuously being set and reset by the market through the interaction of supply and demand okay that is what pricing is so sometimes prices shoot up sometimes prices fall as you have seen okay so one what, what happens when prices go uh, when prices shoot up what happens to supply as a slightly lag response supply will also increase okay if corn prices are going up many farmers will want to switch to planting corn okay so in a capitalist you should understand all these these are all very important conceptual uh, uh, frameworks that you should have in your mind what is the basic difference between socialism and capitalism that in a cap the resource allocation in a socialist economy is done by the central planning committee okay they decide how much is to be used for planting corn how much is to be used for planting soybeans okay therefore uh, they decide everything centrally whereas in a market economy in a capitalist economy the market there are markets for everything and individuals take decisions individual corn farmers will decide to move into planting soybeans if soybean prices are going up much more they will see that's a more profitable so it is the market system price discovery which uh, drives the allocation of resources okay as the price of something goes up people are uh, enticed to supply more of that because this the price is going up okay and in reverse etc okay so this is very important so this is price discovery and so when we talk about pricing the correct meaning of pricing really is just the setting of prices so you don't need a model to do pricing because the market is always doing pricing okay later on when you do see when you do this concept of implied ball eyeball when you do eyeball you will understand that eyeball actually represents the meeting point of pricing and valuation Eyeball is actually a meeting as it represents a meeting point of uh, pr pricing and valuation. Okay, what is happening is uh, what happened. Are you sure to score again two bar, bar points? Okay, where do we seat you? Okay, okay. So, uh, so are you are you able to follow this? This is a very important discussion that we had. This is already in your notes, by the way. Okay, please make sure that. But I think most of you have uh, become clueless about it. It's a very important point. To understand the fundamental difference between the technical difference between a capitalist economy and a socialist economy, how how resource allocation is done in the two economies. Because resource allocation decides everything. In our country, you notice that there is a lot of uh, uh, excess inventory of real estate. There is a lot of if you look at the National Housing Bank comes out with uh, information every couple of years. I think with uh, with they had there were particular statistic that I track, which is. Uh, which is the ready to move in housing which is not occupied okay so that gives you an idea of overbuilding in the market ready to move in housing which is not ideally there should be a tenant at least there if not the owner but there is an inventory and I remember I have not tracked it for a few years now but I remember seeing for several years that that figure kept on going up because there's overbuilding because of all kinds of uh, you know regulatory issues and capital market risk constraint issues okay because of capital control people have nowhere else to put their money if we had free capital uh, you know free capital markets uh, free capital account a lot of that money might have gone over, over offshore into other investments etc so anyway so you have so you can see that you can say from a systemic point of view this is a misallocation of resources all that cement and concrete and steel and all that has gone into building all this how all this housing which nobody is occupying 
ready to move in housing which noted so you can say from a systemic point of view this is a misallocation of resources all that is used up now all that cement and stuff you understand all this you understand what we're talking about okay these are all important things that these are from a macroeconomic policy point of view okay so so we say that so therefore pricing is not correct because you don't need a model to do pricing okay what it actually is a valuation this is what is valuation valuation is essentially what we call fair value models okay which you have already done okay this all this stuff that you have done in terms of npv and all that do you realize these are all you haven't heard this expression fair value model have you heard this expression fair value model okay but these are all fair value models okay all this stuff that you guys have done irr npv okay value of a stock okay the stock value if you take the example of a stock valuation model okay let's say the gordon growth model okay sorry come again no book value is is uh, you can see what the book value is by looking at the accounts okay but the point is when you're talking about fair value models okay what is a fair value model what is happening why here what happened now Ridhima is also talking we have to deduct marks from her team I don't know why everybody is uh, suddenly very switched on. These are all important concepts and I don't think you guys have a very good understanding of these concepts. And everybody is kind of switched off. I don't know what the problem is. Is there some problem? Then you should tell me. <laughs> if there is a problem, you should tell me what the problem is. Instead of, I'm not seeing people engaged with, and it's not like you are experts in all this stuff. If I ask questions, people are not able to answer at an expert level. But yet people are sort of switched off. I don't know what the... I don't know what the the game plan is. I'm not able to follow. Everybody should be looking at me uh, and uh, engaging with what is being discussed in the class. You guys are not experts in all this stuff. These are all important concepts. We just had a discussion about socialist versus capitalist economies. So these are all important things which you have to be aware of as an MBA student. But I don't know why people are just switched off. lot of uh, uh, activity and uh, you know people just switched off from the discussion so understand this concept these are all concepts that you're you're doing a course on financial modeling you are uh, you were about to do some outside course you should have a basic I will hopefully have some time later on to have a general theoretical discussion on model I'm sure if I ask you now what is the model you will not be able to answer give me a proper theoretical answer okay so understand okay let's at least understand this concept of a fair value model these, this thing, Gordon growth model, which you have done for stock valuation, this is an example of a fair value model, okay? Fair value model, actually this requires an, a discussion or theoretical discussion of models, but essentially what, it, what is the fair value model? What, it, what does it do? It essentially, FBM, uh, So in the Gordon growth model, what is the asset that you are valuing? No. The share price, okay. You are valuing the common stock, okay. So we can actually, maybe we should have that small discussion on models now itself because it will be important for us to proceed further and you need to have this theoretical uh, understanding, okay. So if we talk about, so the asset being valued in this case in the Gordon growth model is the, uh, un the common stock. Okay, so you're valuing the common stock and what are the inputs that you're using in the Gordon growth model? Dividends, dividends. dividends. okay, continuous growth stream of dividends and anything else? Growth rate, growth rate of dividends, okay, discount and the discount rate, okay. So if you take the full form of the Gordon growth model, okay, you have the uh, R and the G and the D, okay. You have the dividends, you have the discount rate and the growth rate okay so what the what a, so the gordon growth model is an example of a fair value model as is your npv irr everything all these are fair value models okay which means essentially these are based on um, these are based on some kind of these are actually forecast based okay these are forecast based models okay so if you see here you take the example of the gordon growth model okay 
let's use the words okay so you have to have an understanding of the garden growth model inputs are as Goel said what discount rate dividends okay G uh, is the growth rate of dividends okay these are the three inputs in the model is that clear everyone agrees okay I'm sure most of you have also forgotten the Gordon growth model at least some of you remember yes. but Kriti's expression tells me that she has forgotten you remember okay so the three inputs in the Gordon growth model are essentially your uh, dividends the growth rate of dividends and the discount rate okay and what is the output here output is equal to the fair value of the stock sorry time is not uh, really because you are using that is a continuous uh, that is an infinite series sum no essentially so we won't we won't take the time as an input period as an input okay because essentially uh, if you in the way you write the you guys remember i hope that that is coming from the sum of an infinite an infinite series a convergent remember there are two types of it you have divergent and combined you've forgotten all this infinite series you've forgotten convergent and this is a convergent and finite series okay that's why there is a sum okay so therefore uh, now so output is the fair value not of stocks but of the stock the fair value of the common stock okay so essentially what we have to understand is now please make sure that we get this okay we're almost there but uh, we'll so so we'll, we'll come back to this but I think I'm going to use this. Yeah, it is the same fair value and intrinsic value thing. But the, the expression that is used in the industry is fair value models. Okay, it's a fair value model which means essentially it's based on a forecast. Okay, it's based on the forecast that if remember here your dividend business is a forecast, your G is also a forecast, dividend is a forecast. Okay, okay, today's dividend is not a forecast, actually, G is the forecast. Because today, I mean, one even one period forward is also a forecast because you can't be sure. Okay, so the growth rate of dividends. Okay. Now Ishan is very happy. We can leave on time. Okay, go. Okay, go.